Well, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. It's, uh, it's nice to be here, once again in the Burke Museum. My name is uh, Workman, Ken Workman of the Duwamish tribe. In Lashutseed, that would be Yayustobstidzda. I am Workman. Atadwabziyishitcha of the Duwamish tribe. Akwayekwa, akwayekwa, siabsiyalcha. That guy. <laughs> that last part was great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle. I am. It's an honor to be standing here before you today on this occasion where so much work has to get done. So much work for Kalkalahech. This is the word that we use in our Lushutsi language that identifies this blackfish. Hebacholadu is a uh, blackfish. And so I would say, Askodida Chetesiaya Twadagui Bashida Fatea Chugs to Seattle, Adisa He Kwa Allah Slahil. Thanking my friends for their journeys on these crowded streets of Seattle to this big house we have here today. And want to welcome you. Welcome you to this place that the Duwamish people have been inhabiting since the Ice Age. So it's about 16,000 years or so. On these hills, on that river, the only river in Seattle, the Duwabs. This is a du, it means inside and Mish is people. So we are the people of the inside. The Duwamish River, the Black River, Lake Washington. We had a village over on um, Lake Sammamish. But it's also important that we say thank you for all the work that's being done in as many ways as we can. And so these words that we use, this Lashutsi language, this native language that we were not allowed to speak for so very long is beginning to come back. And so what I s would like to do is say thank you to our Tlingit friends from Alaska. And so the word that they use is Gunalchish. And so when they hear that word here in Seattle, they know this is a good place. But the people here recognize who they are. 300 miles south of them, you run into the Haida, who use Hawa for that same word. The Simpson. They're 100 miles east of the Haida. They use Deutschkum. On the west coast of Vancouver Island, the Nuchinalt use Tleiko. On the U.S.-Canadian border, the Lummi and the Saanich use Haiska. Our friends to the north of us right here, the Tulalips use Tig. Right here on this land, the Suquamish, the Duwamish, the Snoqualmie, the Muckleshoot, the Puyallup, we use Kui. So when I say Esquidi of Chud, I am in the state of thanking you. And our friends on the Columbia River, the Chinook, they use Hayo. And so in all of these ways, we say thank you. We thank you for the work that's being done here today. Uh, thank you for your big work. Your big hearts. Your great strength. And as my grandfather stood just a few miles west of us on the shores of Alki, and he said just 167 years ago, he said to these strangers, Come here to this land. Tlalil, bring your canoe ashore onto this land. You are welcome here. And he said, Gui. In this word, it means welcome. This means welcome a person. But when we go gui gui, it means welcome a whole canoe of people. <laughs> but when we say gui gui hidak, this means everybody is welcome here. And so we as Duwamish continue to do that today, just as my grandfather did a century and a half ago. We say gui gui hidak di siyayan di shogurafata Duwamish. Gui gui hidak. And with that, I would like to introduce Mr. Jesse Nightwalker, inherent um, headsman of the Palouse tribe. Jesse, would you like to say a few words? Uh, 
Um, I want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank you, Ken, for allowing us to be on your territory, for allowing us to hold, you know, space and to be in the presence, you know, of, of your ancestors as well as ours as the Palouse, while Yikma Nakayim from Snake River. So I wanted to sit there and I wanted to thank each and every one of you for um, coming here tonight and the work that has to be done in order to help um, save the the relative of ours, you know, out in the waters, you know, and, and as well for everything on the land, you know, that the water helps provide for. So I wanted to sit there and say thank you for everyone who's here tonight, you know, that are in this care, you know, everybody that's gonna be presenting tonight, you know, Jim, you know, Jim Waddell, you know, Ken, you know, and everybody else who's, who's, who's doing the work. You know, me, myself, you know, I am here, um, I am here because, you know, I was, I'm next in line as the headsman for our territory, for the Palouse. In the 1953 or 54, my elders were promised by Senator Magnuson, Senator Henry Scoop Jackson, that these dams would come down in 2010 and our land would be restored to us. You know, you want to talk about someone who's paid the ultimate price. I do believe my relatives and my ancestors paid that price because the graveyards were removed. My family was removed as one of the last Aboriginal villages along the Snake River in order to put these dams up. My land was taken, my elders were forced off of the land. My mother was only a child. My mother was only a child when removed. You know, this has a really, you know, this was, you know, when I say this in the late 50s, a lot of people say this is not that long ago because it wasn't. When that handshake agreement was kept, you know, it should have been kept because like I stated at that meeting, if the dams came down in 2010, do you really think that we'd be here worrying? No. We would have at least have an eight year expansion of to see what happened. The restoration, you know, of everything. So I wanted to say thank you each and every one of you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, everyone that's here. Thank you to all of our relatives on and off the land the ones who are suffering. I wanna say thank you for all of the knowledge that's going into this and to what's already there as to what you're gonna be hearing tonight from the few of the other speakers. The evidence is already there. So I wanna thank each and every one of you for being here. I wanna thank Aaron Tam for being a part of this also. You know, he went to our dinner this last May Every, every uh, the uh, second Saturday in May of every year, ever since my grandmother was removed off of the lands, we hold a dinner there on Snake River. So every year since 60, 61, 62, 63, all the way up. And we just had our dinner in May this last year again. We lost my grandmother in 2000. And we continue on with that, with that going there every year. So I wanted to say thank you though wanted to say thank you for everything for with what you've come here and everything that we can accomplish together thank you. so I want to say thank you my hands go up to each and every one of you that's taken the time out of your lives so I want to say thank you oh all my relations thank you. and welcome. Let's get right to work. I would like to briefly thank Dr. Jeff Bradley in the Burke Museum for allowing us to hold this event at this cornerstone of Pacific Northwest history and culture. The Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture was founded in 1885. It is the oldest public museum in Washington State 
and was designated the State Museum in 1899. Its administration resides with the University of Washington College of Arts and Science. The Burke recognizes that the museum sits on the ancestral land of the native peoples of Washington State. The Burke holds a deep respect for indigenous knowledge and is dedicated to collaborating with diverse native populations, sharing collections and learning together. The Burke is a research and collections-based museum that serves many audience, audiences and communities, including Washington State residents, tourists and visitors to Seattle, educators and students, indigenous Pacific communities, and researchers, scholars, and enthusiasts. The 16 million objects and counting in the Burke collections are used in many ways, including research and education. My name is London Fletcher. I am president and founder of the Blue Advocates Group and, and a trainee research assistant at the Orca Research Trust in New Zealand. It is a special privilege for me to be introducing tonight's Master of Ceremonies. Since it is five years ago that a tiny, toothless wisp of a girl stood up and asked him if there's any way to figure out what killer whales are saying when they vocalize. Unknown to him, his answer would change the course of that little girl and her family's life forever. His words would inspire her to devote her life to the protection of killer whales and inspire her to, per, per, to pursue a career in acoustics. Of course, that little girl was me, and the man I'm about to introduce is our very own local legend and champion for the rights of, of the southern resident killer whales, Mr. Howard Garrett. <laughs> Howard has been the main driving force behind the efforts to free Tokate, the captive killer whale and LPOD member. The captive killer whale, an LPOD member, or Lolita, as she's also known, to the millions who fight for her freedom. She has been held captive in the Miami Sea Aquarium for over 47 years. Howard is also the co-founder of the Orca Network and the Langley Whale Center. He began working as a field researcher with the Center for Whale Research on San Juan Island in 1981. He then spent 10 years as a naturalist in Massachusetts, studying humpback whales and the habitat which supports them. Howard returned to San Juan Island and the Center for Whale Research in 1993 and since, and since 1995 has helped conduct a campaign to return Tokate. In 2001, him and his wife Susan Berta founded Orca Network based near Bush Point, Woodby Island which today has close to a quarter million followers. He also opened up the Langley Whale Center in 2014. Howard gives presentations on orca natural history, conservation, and capti captivity issues in Washington and beyond, and is interviewed by media for stories about orcas, including Blackfish in 2012. He has written a three volume series of books about Salish Sea orcas, orcas in our midst, and during his time on the East Coast, New England whales. He's beloved by orca advocates worldwide for his kind demeanor and willingness to involve anyone and everyone in the efforts to save our southern residents. His lifelong devotion to these whales has touched the lives of so many people, and I would not be here speaking to you today if not for his encouraging words and endless support over the years. I am humbled by his kindness and his immense generosity, and I hope to honor the legacy that he, his wife, and his brother have built for us all. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm and thunderous applause to our very own Howard Garrett. I have never been introduced to anything like that. <laughs> Thank you so much, London. There's nobody I'd rather be introduced by than London Fletcher. I really appreciate it. Wow. Uh, how do I follow that? Um, well, 
all I can, well, I'm going to have to read from my notes here uh, because words are really important and I tend to forget them a lot. So, and we don't have teleprompters, so I'm just going to have to refer to the pages. Um, but this is already a really interesting evening and it's going to be all the more so. There's a lot more coming. We haven't even gotten to the main events yet. We'll try to lay out some verifiable and scientific facts because the one thing I, I cherish about this group is that we do the research. We look into the realities, into the, the best available scientific knowledge and the histories and long experience. So you're going to get the real scoop here tonight. And there may also be some myth-busting going on. Through it all, our basic unifying value is to provide more food for Southern residents. What actions can we take to give these hungry orcas the most possible Chinook in the least possible time, in the most politically feasible way? We now know very clearly how to bring southern residents the most food in the shortest time. But trying to maneuver through that political and social obstacle course to get the job done is like a Game of Thrones intense drama with kings and queens and knights and renegades and liars and honest men and women, all playing a deadly serious game for control of kingdoms. In this case, four dams in eastern Washington. Those dams seem to be that important to a lot of people, even though they're killing whole watersheds and ways of life and costing literally billions in ratepayer and taxpayer money and provide, in fact, nothing to anyone that can't be easily replaced. And yet it seems that for most Washington leaders, it's somehow an existential threat to even suggest that those damn dams ever be breached, especially when they hear it, that it can be done in a matter of months. See how it's really just a people problem? The misunderstandings and hurt feelings and cold shoulders are distressing and really hard to deal with. And progress often seems impossible. But we're here anyway to help return enough Chinook salmon to Northwest marine ecosystems to avoid the countdown to extinction of J, K, and L pods. And in fact, improve the economy of Western Washington, not to mention so many other absolutely necessary benefits. In hopes of gaining enough public consensus and political fortitude to make it happen. And that's what we're here for tonight. There have been some powerful motivators in the past few weeks, especially since July 24th. We've seen painful photos of J35 Talequa holding her deceased calf as if to life itself for 17 days. And in the past few weeks, we've seen three and a half year old J50 Scarlet looking like every breath may be her last. Most major media across the country and even worldwide have been sharing their stories of grief and loss, creating a huge upwelling of passionate determination to help them somehow. I think we can relate to what they're going through. We have similar emotions, affections, and attachments our Lummi friends remind us that orcas are Gweltholmichtin, the people who live under the water. These orcas, or killer whales, or blackfish, or Gweltholmichtin, are in many ways our relatives. And thanks mainly to over 40 years of photo ID studies, we know these whales as individuals with histories and families. 
Just a few years ago, news of incoming residents brought smiles to our hearts. But we don't see them as much as we used to, and they're more split up and spread out and don't greet and socialize as much as they used to, although they still do whenever they can. What the Southern residents are going through right now must be devastating to them. They all know each other intimately beyond anything we can experience since before they were born. And they all need each other, absolutely. Their togetherness is truly their home. They've had no predators for millions of years, so no fear, no need to fight or flee. But what if they can't find enough food? How are they dealing with the losses of so many family members over the years in the predicament they're in now, unable to bring a new one into their clan for the past three years? Please don't doubt that they know exactly what's happening to them. J35 has given the world real insight into her emotional response to her lost baby, but so many others have died in recent years. We've all heard the numbers, 70% reproductive failures, down to the lowest population in 30 years. You'll hear a lot more about their precarious numbers and dwindling matrilines lines from Ken in a few minutes. Are Southern residents mourning the looming disappearance of their entire tribe? I'm pretty sure we are. A lot of us feel frustrated, maybe grumpy, and more determined than ever to do whatever might help which is mostly correcting our own society's mistakes. We need to restore as much salmon spawning and rearing habitat as we possibly can. We have a lot of work to do. Of course, there are thousands of things we need to do. Every kind of protection and restoration along rivers and shorelines and estuaries and wetlands and whole oceans, and the list goes on. All such efforts need funding and volunteers and probably lawyers. Many steps have been taken. Their endangered listing under the ESA in 2005 and Governor Inslee's executive order, Orca Protection Order in March of this year, setting up the Orca Recovery Task Force. These have been important public statements but the whales need more fish. Restoring salmon passage and spawning to 140 miles of main stem Snake River and 5,500 miles of Snake River wilderness spawning areas would bring back a significant part of the ancestral diet of the southern resident orcas. Chinook are resilient they can rebuild rapidly from just a few spawners if they have access to good habitat to do it. Jim will have much more about how to do this after Ken speaks. Spoiler alert. <laughs> You'll hear that notching the berms, that's about all it will take beside each of the four dams with bulldozers no concrete has to be blown up, has been thoroughly studied by the Army Corps of Engineers and described in its 2002 EIS, which is still in effect. Jim will talk about the surplus hydropower and the wasted billions on the dams and solutions for grain transport and irrigation and methods and benefits of breaching and the hundreds of acres of bountiful bottomland that could come back into production as orchards and vineyards that were there before the dams were built. It's shovel ready and it wouldn't take much more than shovels to do it and bring back millions of adult salmon to southern residents. We'll hear about all of that and tonight we're lucky to have two scientists who know what they're talking about. 
Our speakers are like bookends. They represent about 90 years of deep knowledge and history of both the biology and the economics, the demographics and the physics and logistics involved in dam breaching. They're kind of like our elders, he said as if I was any younger. <laughs> Ken Balcom has been studying cetaceans, especially southern residents, for almost his entire adult life. He's incredibly rigorous and systematic about data collection. I know, I've been there. His data was essential to the ESA listing in 2005. And we wouldn't know southern residents are in such serious trouble now without the data provided by the Center for Whale Research. But that doesn't rule out his caring a lot about those whales. And I have to admit, I'm proud of him. Okay, he's my brother, but that doesn't change anything. Jim Waddell is a civil engineer, which calls for a lot of reality checking. He took another look at the Army Corps' 2002 EIS that he helped write. Jim was deputy district engineer for programs at the Walla Walla Army Corps. His job, in part, was to ensure that that EIS was unbiased. Another spoiler alert, it failed on many counts. It contains great information showing that dam breaching is the best and now it's pretty clear the only way to recover the ESA listed salmon and steelhead, but that was not the decision rendered by the Northwest commanders. Jim realized the cost benefit ratio was way off and that breaching the dams would save vast sums of public money and did I mention it would provide southern residents with a whole lot of desperately needed fish? Congressional approval is not needed to breach the dams. And there is no need for another lengthy EIS and court litigation process either. Logistically and legally, the dams could begin to be breached this year in December. But there's a massive, inert slack water of belief that either we should never even talk about it or that it would take a long, long time to breach the dams. And those beliefs are actually the only reason it would take a long time. It's a classic self-fulfilling prophecy. And the casualties of this debacle are the wild salmon and the southern resident orcas and the people who should be living on the banks of the Snake River today. We're all subject to 50 plus years of pro-dam disinformation, originally to get the dams built in the first place, promising a booming shipping metropolis in Lewiston and electrifying and irrigating the barren plains while replacing the wild fish with mass-produced hatchery fish. It's still being churned out to this day, far and wide, by pro-dam lobbies and politicians to and by elected leaders and agency officials and chambers of commerce and port authorities and academics and journalists and farm groups and even environmentalists, et cetera, et cetera, to keep the dams right where they are. But JK and LPOD can't wait to find food much longer. So we have to correct the record and free the snake. Fortunately, a lot of people seem to be hearing the real facts just lately, and they're starting to demand that the dams be breached sooner rather than later. Motivated most recently by J35's tour of grief and J50's sad spectacle, Phone calling and letter writing campaigns, especially since early August, have flooded Governor Inslee's office, among others, pleading with them to act now to urge the Army Corps to breach the dams. And in late August, Governor Inslee issued a recommendation to the ORCA task force to consider breaching, which was discussed in breakout sessions. 
at the Anacortes Task Force meeting where they ask the questions that are answered in the letter to the task force you'll find on the tables, just so you'll know what to look for. So we're kind of a truth squad. And by default, a fact-finding committee to bring you the realities of breaching to the attention of the task force and the public. And this tonight is our report to you. That's what we're doing tonight. So after the talks, we hope to have a good productive Q&A and discussion, and it's all in the interest of reality checking. First up is Ken Balcom, founder and chief scientist at the Center for Whale Research and director of Orca Survey. Ken, you're up. Okay, well, this pointer works too. So we're down here. This is the world as we know it. The Northwest is the best part of this world that I know. Uh, anyway, before all that, I, I want to thank Ken and Jesse and your ancestors for welcoming our ancestors to these amazing lands and waters. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for attending tonight. I know this is a subject very dear to us. And uh, I, I guess it's uh, bringing out a little activism spirit in all of us. We have to do something. Let's see if I can uh, change the picture here. So, uh, okay, we'll play this and there should be some sound coming out at some point. We don't want to blare everybody away, but besides shooting still pictures for 42 years, uh, I'm also a, a, a vidiot. I, I just love to take or be involved in taking movies or now videos. This is in the first year that we studied. That was L10 diving under the bow of our boat. I was amazed that after decades of captures that these whales, uh, you know, they adopted us. They, we were really the only boat out there. And uh, they escorted us through fog, let us go with them wherever they traveled. And they had very set travel patterns. This is my son when he was very young. He's now what, 54? I'm not, I can't believe it actually, but that's apparently true. Uh, and this is before it was against the law to be near whales uh, without a permit. But uh, in this case, we're, we're watching some whales that are approaching and uh, happen to have a real fun zoom lens. This is in the 80s. And uh, then we pan up to the porch and here, these, we had Earthwatch teams that helped us. Shanna here was one of yes. our Earthwatch members. My best experiences <laughs> <laughs> Well, we had 10 teams a year of 10 people that would come and help us take pictures. This was black and white photo identification. We had to process film every night. The next day, identify the pictures, who's there. Uh, and then in winter months, we'd have Mike Big visit, and we would confirm the IDs of all the whales that he and I had seen in the course of a season, which usually ran from May to September. The whales were in the area of the San Juans almost every day. It, it was phenomenal. And they were in these groups that were leisurely traveling along, and. Uh, they were catching fish. Fish were so ab abundant, abundant, that's a nice word, uh, that uh, they didn't really work very hard. It just seemed like they were like, when, when I was a kid, I was a sheepdog. I was herding sheep with a friend who had a dog, actually, and I learned that sheep are afraid of dogs, but they're not afraid of people. 
and uh, they move when the dog wants them to move. The fish move when the whales want them to move. And then they eat some on the fringes as they go by. Uh, well, anyway, this was a magic time of life. I, I never thought that I would be uh, still doing this. It was supposed to be a six-month study. <laughs> but, uh, oh, I pushed the wrong button, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I got to point it the other way. Oops. Point it back one. Okay, well, Howie mentioned uh, this is J35, Talequa pushing her dead baby. Uh, when we saw her doing that the first day, it was things we'd seen before. When we saw it the second day, well, we'd seen that before too. But then the third day and the fourth day and the fifth day and on to 17 days, it was just unprecedented. Let's see if I can. So uh, here, that brought world attention to the plight of these whales. We were wondering why nobody was listening, but now they're listening. Uh, we had this young whale, J50. She had a difficult birth in uh, December 2014, but uh, she survived. And here she was last September, looking pretty fat, nice rounded back. And uh, here she was just a couple days ago. We see this condition we call peanut head. This is, we've never seen a whale recover when they're this seriously emaciated. But she's still going along. I think instead of calling her Scarlet, we should call her Bunny for Energizer Bunny. She just, every once in a while, just keeps up and trucks along. And I, I wish her well, but uh, apparently there are plans afoot to capture her and try and treat her. Uh, she's with her mom and sister. She's feeding herself, and they're feeding her. Uh, with any salmon around, she might be able to be rehabilitated by her family. Just as we were beginning this talk tonight, I got a call that uh, uh, they were asking me if I would participate in the capture operations, and I, I didn't say hell no, but there's no way, no way. This, She's now, whether or not she survives, she's in the best place possible with a family. Uh, well, let's see if this will roll. Good. This is kind of what it used to be like. Lots and lots of whales. It was just amazing. And then this is kind of what a drone look at these whales might offer where you could know every individual whale, look at their social patterns, see who's feeding who, who's playing with who, maybe even who's mating with who. I don't know if, if uh, I mean, all that's basically been deciphered after the fact with this remarkable molecular genetic work where now we know the father of every whale in uh, our southern resident population. But you know, this is a kind of a nice line of breast foraging for fish, herding fish, in kind of a relaxed pattern. Uh, it just, this is the way I recall it. It was just amazing. It's all very coordinated. They know what they're doing and they're working together and they're uh, also socializing together. These are probably matrilineal groups. Uh, again, it will be nice to identify every whale in there and see what the association patterns are. But those are just interesting science things. What we already know is they need to eat. They need food. And uh, that's, that's why we're here. Uh, I don't know if this will continue rolling on, but I want to get some of the credits here at the end. 
I guess people don't mind watching whales, so we'll just, <laughs> we'll just watch a little bit of. <laughs> yeah, I, I I could do this. All, yeah, all day I could watch this kind of stuff. But uh, that's the way it used to be. But this footage isn't from here. It's from Japan. Just a couple of days ago. It's awesome. They still have thriving population of whales and they still have uh, abundant prey resources. So uh, the resident story goes back a long time. I'll do a little quick overview but they basically descended from North Atlantic residents and uh, spread out in the uh, coastal waters from Asia to here in Puget Sound and they were fish eater ancestry. They eat, all of them eat fish, and ours happen to be specialists in the Chinook salmon, northern residents also, and Alaska residents. And out here you have a little more wide feeding. They eat some other species, some uh, uh, pollock and abundant species there. And apparently the Japanese killer whales are eating pollock which uh, is an abundant prey resource and they're doing quite well. I think it would be interesting to do a comparative study, look at the demographics of that population versus this. But what happened was our, our resident whales, this is looking at the Pleistocene, the ice ages, and uh, when they came over from the North Atlantic, the only way they could get here was swim by water. And a lot of time, the Bering Strait was closed with land. And that's when humans came over 15, 16,000 years ago. And uh, when it was land, and only recently we now have water. But the whales came over 120,000 years ago, the resonant ecotype. And the transient ecotype came over 340,000 years ago. They're totally different beasts. They have different diets, different evolution, different gastric juices. There's no way that they can, uh, that our resident whales can change diet and start eating seals. And you know, we shouldn't be impolite to people that suggest that, but uh, straighten them out. <laughs> so okay, as we know, the population when we began was about 70 or 71. And uh, as of July 1 each year, we report this to the government. It got almost to 100 by 1995, and then began a dramatic decrease, and now we're down to 75 as of this past July. Uh, we'll come to this slide later, but uh, most of the decrease has been in LPOD. And uh, as pointed out, we know every whale that was born and every whale that has died the red bars indicate the, the numbers of whales in a given year that died or were born in the blue bars. Uh, you know, all this is very, uh, there's no doubt about any of that information. And we know that uh, when we put the mortality bars over what the fish abundance is, that uh, basically we've color coded all the river systems that produce salmon and the number of salmon harvested and escaped in each system. This was British Columbia in the early years, and this is current. This is Columbia River in the early years, and this is current. We know it takes about four million adult Chinook salmon in the ecosystem for these whales to maintain a lifestyle that doesn't have big mortality bars, and we know that when we have lots of fish, we have not only better survival, but we have more fecundity, more whales are born. So uh, the answer to the question here is, uh, what number of fish are we gonna allow the whales to have? Humans are catching these fish, the fish are trying to get to the rivers to spawn, but fisheries management has to allow first and foremost, these whales sufficient food to survive. <clears throat> so uh, 
Jane Cogan, one of our neighbors, is a real data-oriented person, and also graphically. She's looked at every river system. Each of these dots is a Chinook River somewhere from Queen Charlotte's down to California. And she has the data for each one of these rivers, the catches, the escapement, the, you know, the basic, uh, I don't, the government may have similar data because actually most of this came from the government, but she's compiled it in a way that allows us to see. But north of us, we got Canada and DFO, they should take care of those fish. South of us, California should take care of those fish. But this part is our responsibility. Yeah. We live here with these whales in this ecosystem yeah. and uh, it's up to us to provide enough food for them. Right. So uh, we'll do a few more specific here. I mentioned Elpod was taking the biggest population declines after this, this glory year. I was hoping we were going to hit 100, but we never quite did. Uh, but when we had this steep decline, I went to the God Squad and told them that we had the problem here and we ought to do something about it. And uh, then in 2005, it took a little while, but 2005 the Endangered Species Act was uh, signed into law. Uh, and yeah, you would think at that point, that's 20 years ago, you'd think at that point we would uh, start taking serious, what do these whales need? And it was obvious to us all from the beginning that they need food. But they're up against a, a big industry, number of big industries. Well, anyway, so we went back to the family scrolls and looked at uh, LPOD. If we look at these, uh, the red boxes here are sexually mature females. The pink boxes are young females that you know, when they're 15 years old, they'll, or 12 to 15, they'll start having babies, we hope. And the blue boxes are mature males, and the pale blue ones are the young guys. Uh, but we'll notice that all these little boxes here are what we call tombstones. You look at this area here, there is no possibility of reproduction in this. You know, it's all boys and, and a female that's reaching her senescence. Uh, there is no possibility, obviously, in here. There is uh, little possibility. Well, there's, we keep hoping L90 will actually have a living calf, but she's had two miscarriages. Anyway, that's what's happening to LPOD, and LPOD is our coastal po uh, pod. They're the ones that are feeding on the Snake River fish more than the J-pod. K-pod... This one is going nowhere, basically. We've got one reproductive female that's producing calves and one young female that may grow up. And hopefully we'll hope for her to have a calf, but that's going to be eight or ten years from now. And then J-Pod was formerly doing the best. And then, of course, now we've seen their recent crash with the crash in the Fraser River salmon. So it's not only the population, it's whether or not they want to be here. This is May to September. All the days, the blues are when the J's are here, the K's are when the uh, red is K's and green is L's. And uh, they were in the area 118 days out of 180, uh, a good part of the time. And, and the fall, September, they were here almost every day in 2015. Here's what it was last year. Very little here. There are only 43 total days that any of them were in and very only three times that we have most of them come in. That was really a bad year and this year is no better. Uh, so yes, the Snake River. Here it is. This is the habitat where we could find more fish than all the rest of the rivers combined if we restore that system. So that's why we're here. Thank you. And I think Jim, if he's already here, is going to be able to tell us how to do it. Thank you. Jim Waddell.
I will give it a shot. Um, let's see, do I have a briefing here? Yeah, let's see. Okay, so um, I'm Jim Waddell, and um, oops, I am a civil engineer, and um, I spent 35 years with the Corps of Engineers and uh, worked at every echelon, did construction all the way to Washington, D.C., did a lot of policy work, even managed to spend some time in the Bush White House working on climate change. Uh, that was no fun, by the way. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it, well, anyway, so we're going to talk about what we call Alternative 4, and that's in the EIS that I have here. It's one of 17 volumes of the EIS. Um, and we're going to explain why this is a viable alternative. But we're also going to talk about, you know, what breaching is all about, what the costs are, what the economics, and what the opportunities are, because this is really huge. The, uh, you know, Ken, you know, people have talked about, you know, things over here in western Washington, but in eastern Washington, this river is kind of like a hidden gold mine. It's been buried under 140 miles of reservoirs for over 50 years. And there's a, a massive amount of opportunity there, and we'll get into that too. So, um, with that, let me dig into this. But first, I want to talk about what is the Chinook urgency? Because you're going to hear me say, and you've already heard it, that we need to get these dams breached in a matter of months. And I also want to point out, though, you know, everybody says, Waddell, you're crazy. You, you can't just go breach dams in a matter of months. Well, I'd like to remind them of it. one important thing, is that we've been at this for 25 years. So it's not like we're just going to start this afternoon and figure this out. People have been working on it. The Corps spent millions of dollars studying it. Um, we've been pecking away at trying to, uh, you know, people have litigated for years. That hasn't gotten anywhere. Um, and so we're, we're, we're at the two-minute drill here. We're, we're down by, yard, I mean, you're, you know, on a 30-yard line. We're uh, 60 seconds left. Um, and um, we're out of timeouts. It's got to be now. And so let me just point out a couple things about what's going on with Schnook just, you know, recently. So first off, this rather complicated looking chart is, is a government chart. It's actually put together by the University of Washington, uh, the Columbia Basin Research Service, but it's all based on government data. And what it's based on is counting fish over dams, which the Corps does every day. They count every adult fish that goes over those Snake River dams. So they know the numbers. Okay, so this, what this chart shows is, is smolt to adult returns. And what that means is, when a little smolt is born up in a natal stream or in a hatchery and it goes down the Snake River and goes down the Columbia River and then goes out in the ocean and gets eaten by stuff and, and orcas and fishermen get them and then they come back and, you know, when, and so this is how many of those fish made it all the way back to their hatchery or to their natal stream. And so historically, you would need, we, we know that these, these SARs were in the four to seven range, okay? And we also, the government, you know, the, the folks that set the goals and standards about what we ought to be trying to do with recovery said, well, we really have to have somewhere in the three to six range to get recovery and maintain it. And, but what's been happening is that over the last 18 years, and this pattern has gone on for years before this, but they just don't put the, all that data on this chart is that we have been averaging over well, the last 10 years just barely over one and you can see that a lot of this time we're well below one and if it wasn't for that one anomaly in 2008 it looked horrible but the bottom line is is if you're below two you're not recovering okay if you're below one you're headed toward what i call what a lot of biologists call functional extinction and that means while you might not be legally extinct, they'll, they'll, these salmon are tough. You can't kill every damn one of them, but you'll get to the point where there's nothing to fish, there's nothing for orcas, there's really nothing for anybody but a few token fish. And, um, and you can see that what's been particularly troublesome is this last five years. And this is a combination of genes that are getting diluted, and, um, and so the gene pool is, is getting reduced. And, but you can see that we're in real trouble here. And, because we're not just below one, <laughs> we're hovering above zero. So that's, the, that's, a, that's one of the metrics, small to adult ratios. Another more obvious one is 
is just total abundance or counts. And <laughs> I love that word, abundance. You know, no one uses that a lot. State agencies use it a lot. It's all about abundance. And you know, you can only have three fish and they'll still use. Our abundance is three fish. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I guess that's better than one, but you know, why do you call it abundance? I mean, you know, these runs we're talking about are 3% of historic. And if you count just the wild fish, it's less than a half of a percent of wild fish are left. This is what we call abundance. So anyway, this shows over lower granite, which was that metric before. This, you know, lower granite is the uppermost of the Snake River dams. And so when they get across lower granite, they get into Idaho, where that habitat that Ken talked about is, is out there. And this is high elevation habitat. That means that with climate change, it's still going to be cool waters where these fish can, can survive and, and spawn. But as you can see from this, for the last three years, we've got a lot of red numbers in here. And these are all declines, and it's really tanking in terms of abundance. And so um, this year, it's, it's no better, and things, some things are worse. The, the fall Chinook, you know, I love the, the fishery agencies, Kate, and I tell them this stuff, but Jim, the fall Chinook are the, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the surprise, they're doing so well, and all this kind of stuff. And, and we wrote a paper three years ago, and we showed that fall Chinook were going to collapse in three or four years. And NOAA Fisheries, you know, we gave them this report, briefed it, and they just basically ignored it and told us we were crazy. We didn't know what we were talking about. Well, there it is. Fall Chinook are collapsing. And, you know, fall Chinook weren't really the primary source of orca food, but now they are. Those orcas are out there now trying to eat fall Chinook. They used to, you know, they're normally they're concentrating on spring and some summer, but now they're having to find whatever they can, including these fall Chinook. So this, this, is, this is the real picture. Now, I just, one of my colleagues, Tyson, here, gave, showed me something the other day, if I can find it. I lost it. Hang on. I had a piece of paper here. Maybe I did lose it. Anyway, I'll tell you what it was. And you guys have probably seen this. Noah put out an ORCA fact sheet on August 31st. And on the second page of that fact sheet, they had a graph of abundance of spring, summer Chinook. And in that, and it was interesting because the report was, was a graph from the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. And you go, well, wait a minute. Noah's got all these numbers. What's going on? They should have, the, these numbers are actual counts. And so what was interesting about this, they used this graphic to show that Chinook are, are doing fine. Orcas are gonna be okay. The Chinook is, is fine. And yet this graphic you only went up to 2016. And then most remarkable about it, it was overestimating number, it, the numbers were incorrect by four, uh, 50,000 Chinook in 2016. That's a lot of, that's a huge error. And as I talked to a colleague of mine in the Corps of Engineers about this last night, what he was pointing out is it looks like that chart, which is probably six years old, was actually modeled predictions back in 2014. But this is what NOAA is putting into a fact sheet a week ago and telling us we don't have a problem. I think we got a problem, folks. The, um, so, so much for their abundance. Oh, here's the other cool thing about NOAA. They, in spite of saying, you know, oh, everything's fine with Chinook, NOAA also put out a report, 2017, and you'll love this. It's called the Spring Summer Chinook Recovery Plan. And it sounds great. It's going to list all these things the, the states and the feds are doing to recover, you know, habitat and everything else in the world, working on dams. And you get down to page 219, and you find this incredible statement that says, in spite of all the actions in this report, none of them will get us to recovery. None of the, nothing in this report will give us to recovery. How on earth could you call it a recovery plan if the whole thing, there's nothing in there collectively that's going to get us to recovery? So this, you know, <laughs> this, uh, this is a classic example of the government not even reading their own stuff. And this is what we've been doing at Damn Sense for a long time, is pulling these government documents in and saying, hey, look, folks, this is what it says. And that's what we've been doing on Damn Sense. 
All right, um, one, did I turn this thing off again? Okay, one other thing I'm gonna show you graphically here. Well, yeah, let's do this. Uh, this, this is what they call jack returns, and the jack's a one-year fish, and they're kind of immature. They don't reproduce or anything, but they use them as predictors of the next year. This is one of the worst jack runs or returns we've seen in, in maybe a decade or two, or uh, probably since the early 90s. And, and what it's showing, of course, is that uh, the, the orange line is the 10-year average. We should be up in here someplace, but you can see we're running real low here. I think it's like this is about a minus 80%. And so this tells us that next year, um, Chinook returns, spring, summer Chinook, are really going to be a lot worse than they are this year, and they're terrible this year. So I don't know what orcas are going to eat. I don't know what the fishermen are going to do. <coughs> but this, this, is, this is what the data says. All right, let me, uh, let's see what's next. Now back to the dams themselves. Uh, you know these are the four dams. Um, you guys know what the purpose of these four dams are? Come on. Are they flood control dams? No, well, you guys are pretty smart. You, you know, there's some guys in Congressman Newhouse is absolutely convinced they're flood control dams. I'm sorry. And anyway, they're not. They, excuse me, I keep thinking this is. A, anyway, each of these dams has a, um, um, a, uh, a spillway, uh, a powerhouse, and this is the navigation lock. And fortunately, they all have an earthen berm. Now, two of them, the, the berm's pretty small, but they've got earthen embankments on the side that we can do. And so when we talk about breaching, what we're talking about is removing this earthen berm. And it's simple. You cut a notch with some bulldozers and, and have at it and lower the, and you're dropping down the reservoir, and, and there you go. Um, Ice Harbor, by the way, is kind of interesting. It has what we call incidental irrigation. So that means the taxpayers aren't paying for any of this irrigation, but the farmers put their pumps in this Anyway, um, we're taking care of those guys. There's, we've got a new estimate for uh, extending their pumps down into the river, and it's about $20 million. It's not that much uh, easy to cover in the breach cost. Okay, so um, just a thing about our sources. Um, the key document is the Lower Snake Feasibility Study. That's this thing, and you can read this. It's on the Corps' website in Walla Walla. If you want to read through it, it's 4,000 pages. But uh, nevertheless, it's there. It's a key document to all this. Um, we're always trying to use stuff in the public domain um, because we want to show that, you know, the public, you know, you can get to this stuff. And, and what I've done, you know, I've spent 10,000 hours probably in the last four or five years, but anybody could have done that. 95% of what I'm telling you tonight, uh, I didn't, I mean, I learned in the last four years. Um, Sure, the Corps of Engineers gave me some insights about what to look for and the instincts, but um, it's really all out there. Um, the folks that are working on this, uh, there's a lot of people like me. Uh, some of them in federal agencies. Uh, some of them um, are still uh, uh, in the service. And um, I just got a call tonight and got a recent brief on what's going on with this uh, court-ordered EIS, and it's a real mess. Um, you know, it's, it's a sham, and they're talking about how do we get breaching out of the study. And of course, that study is not even relevant because we got one right here, and I'll talk more about that. Um, anyway, recently we've got some help from the Milgard Foundation, and uh, so uh, we're, we've done all that. Um, one of the things that we wanted to prove, though, with this work is that you could, in fact, update an EIS with a small number of people very quickly. And so this is, when you hear the government say, oh, it takes, you know, this is an old EIS, it takes upgrading and all this kind of stuff, it takes a long time. No, it doesn't. In fact, we've already done 95% of the work with mostly government people. And these are government people that are trying to get the word out. And they're trying to, and their bosses are suppressing them and stuff like this, and that's why I get calls from anonymous people in the middle of the night, or, you know, and, and they tell me what's going on. So, um, the, they're... Now, let me talk about some of the cost drivers. Um, first off, the, the four dams have never been economically viable. In 1947, when they did the, the, the major study, the benefit cost ratio was below one, um, but they cheated. They, they rigged the economics. It's right there in the reports. You can read what they did to get it over one. And, um, and today, the BCR is still well below one. Um, 
compared to breaching. Um, the, um, with breaching, your benefit ranges from four to one. That's like for every um, one dollar you invest, you get four dollars in benefits. This is what we have today is 15 cents on the dollar. With, with, if you keep the dams, your tax money for every dollar you pay, you get 15 cents back over the life of the project. You don't have to be a business major to figure out that's not good. So um, the reason we have a big range here on benefits with breaching is it depends on whether you really want to replace what is now, or has been for a long time, surplus power. And it's, it's worse now because we're losing, BPA's losing money big time on surplus sales. Also, um, the full up cost to tax and rate payers, and what I mean by that is what does BPA and the Corps pay on an annual basis right now versus their revenue? And that's really kind of critical because the economic analysis is over 100 years, but you really want to know, are you making money or are you losing money on these dams? And the answer is, for at least the last five years, it looks like costs have exceeded revenues. And, and this has helped lead Bonneville to the dire financial situation that they have admitted they're in. Also, um, your tax money, $1 billion of it, was invested in what we call alternatives two and three in this EIS. And that was uh, don't breach the dams, let's hang more hardware on it, let's put more fish in barges and take them down the river. Well, um, a billion dollars later, on two alternatives that are stated in the EIS that would have less benefit than doing nothing. So we did w something worse than nothing. And we spent a billion dollars your tax money and we got nothing for it as you saw in those SARs and abundance charts. Um, okay, and then, um, and then this of course has led to the downward spiral of Chinook available for southern residents and for humans. And, it, and of course it's devastating the fishery and tourist income as well all over the northwest. Um, I just a bit about the cost of dam operation. This is what I, you know, learned how to do in the Corps of Engineers, and we've but have spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. In the meantime, is this really tricky because you've got BPA spending money and you've got the Corps spending money, and there's all these debt arrangements that goes back and forth between the agencies. But basically, what it's telling us is that each the four dams cost about 227 million dollars in 2017, and the revenues were maybe 200, but those are based on numbers the Corps was using five years ago. It's probably more like 180, but anyway, let's just be conservative, we we're, we're lost at least $27 million on those four dams uh, last year. Um, Tony Jones, our hydropower guy, where's Tony? There he is right here. Now he can get into these numbers and tell you everything. He's, he's done more research, he knows how to look at the government data and pull it up. He can even show you how to do it yourself on your cell phone, right? <laughs> so anyway, talk to Tony too, and, he, we, and we got questions for him later. So um, the overall, like I said, the overall benefit cost for the life cycle of the project, and actually Earth Economics helped us go back into the economic appendix of the core study and correct the tables which were atrocious, even according to planners in the Corps of Engineers that said, Jim, I can't figure this stuff out. So we had to go to Earth Economics and we spent a lot of time unraveling the benefit cost tables. And basically, after correcting some errors we found, um, the rule is Earth Economics had to stick to the government planning guidance. They couldn't make up their own economic accounting rules. They had to do it the way the government said do it. And what we get, 15 cents on the dollar. Um, now, a little fun here. Let's see, you guys know who this is? Yeah, Elliot Meinzer, yeah, we got his name up there. But anyway, he's head of the Bonneville Power Administration, okay? And in March, he was testifying before the Power Planning Council, which is the people that your governors have put in place to keep, make sure that we're not getting screwed on our power rates and the dams aren't killing our salmon. So can you play this? Uh, yeah, let's listen to what he had to say. To be you know, really frank, you know, if, if, there's a, if there's an axis of sort of nonchalance uh, to panic, uh, you know, I, 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 I think it's important that we don't get into a panic mode. I'm not in a panic mode, but I'm in a, a very, very significant sense of urgency mode, and I do think that the risks facing Bonneville are real, and I feel that even though we've got 10 years left in our long-term contracts until 2028, 
uh, that the time for action, and I think real action, is now. Okay, so there's the, the CEO of one of the biggest utility companies in the United States, basically telling us we're, he's close, this close to panic. Now, if you own stock in that company, you'd either be shooting that guy or selling your stock. I don't know which, but anyway, this, this is what makes this sort of incredible, is that I don't have to, I'm not making this stuff up. This guy, <laughs> he's saying it. Bonneville is broke, but nobody knows it. That might be the most important thing anybody said in the last 20 years in the Pacific Northwest, and it went virtually unreported. Anybody hear that before, tonight? Unless you saw it in one of our documents, one person. Wow, congratulations. Um, are, you, are you with Bonneville Power Administration? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so here's the problem, and this is a chart out of Bonneville Power's strategic plan they came out with in March, and he's briefing it to the Power Planning Council, is that this green line, and I know it's a little hard to see, but we wanted to use their chart so we don't get accused of making anything up, is the green line shows Bonneville's cost and what they sell hydropower to us to do these lights up here. And you can see that we're at about $37 a megawatt hour these now. And of course, you can see that it's been going up pretty steadily, and that's, you know, and you're paying these rate increases. Um, what's, what's killing them, though, is that if you went to the open market, this is the prices going down here. And so there's a $12 difference or so right now. And so Bonneville is really in a, if you're in a business and this is your competitor and this is you, it's bad news, really bad news. And so how do you turn that around? Uh, Bonneville has got to do some serious cost cutting. Well, I'll get to what that means in a second. This red mark up here is basically what we think, roughly speaking, it costs to produce a megawatt of power on the lower snake dams. Okay, so that you can see that it's way above what even Bonneville is getting. Now, down here, this, 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 this is surplus power that's being sold, and I'm going to show you what that means in a minute, but a lot of this power that Bonneville is putting out at these high prices is being sold as a surplus uh, to California, most of it. Now, you notice that it says minus 16. So when you're selling something for minus 16, do you know what that means? You're paying somebody to take your product off your hands because you've got too much of it. Okay, so... And you're probably saying, well, why don't they just turn the turbines off and spill the water? Well, you can't do that. You've heard this, maybe this thing about gas, dissolved gas in the water and gas bubble trauma on salmon, which is the same thing as bins for divers. Well, when you spill more water, you're putting more of this gas in the water. So they have to run the turbines. They have no choice. And they're losing money doing, running these turbines. And so the only thing you can do is completely take a dam out of service, basically put it into a non-operational mode, but you also got to get the water out of the reservoir because you can't spill it. In other words, you can't just turn the turbines off. You have to lower the water, and that's what we're going to do with breaching. So uh, here's some of the stats that Tony worked up for us. Uh, he went back and looked at every hour of production for 96,000 hours of the Lower Snake River dams. What he found was only two hours were actually needed by BPA customers. The rest of it dumped on the open market, sold as surplus at a loss. Wind was curtailed 40 times in 2017 because they had so much surplus power. Um, just shut the wind turbines off. So those people, in some cases, lost money. And a lot of these are farmers in eastern Washington. You know, when you go out to eastern Washington, you see those windmills? Those are that land that on, is on is, is mostly farmland, and those farmers are getting money. But when they curtail it, a lot of those farmers get nothing, and some of them have early, earlier, the guys that did it a long time ago, they've got contracts that give them some rebate, but it's not full cost. Um, and, and how many people have heard this over the last 20 years? If you breach the Snake River dams, the lights are going to go out in Seattle. I mean, you know, this is, well, maybe, you know, we were in eastern Washington. This is like, they say it every minute. Anyway, the lights are not going to go out in Seattle, I guarantee you. Tony.
Come on, Tony. I, I, yeah, okay, so what he said was the, um, the two hours, BPA could have used thermal. In other words, there was idle thermal pounds and they could have been turned on, but instead we dipped into the surplus by two hours. And so that's basically what it is. Um, we, during the question and answer session, I'm, I, I am going to get Tony to the mic, so <laughs> if you've got a, a question for him, he's a little shy. <laughs> um, oh, crud, I just turned it off again. Um, okay, some of the other stats on BPA, they're basically 99, their, their debt to asset ratio is 99%. You know what? If you have a mortgage and you got that, you're in trouble. And that's one of the things, they don't pay off their mortgage really. They refinance back and forth, but they're not really paying down their debt, which is now about $17 billion. Um, they have nearly zero days cash reserve. This is unheard of for utility. They're normally 200 and something days. Um, the customers are leaving and the, the ones that can leave are like factories and people that have these uh, short-term contracts. You heard Elliot mention 10 years on contracts. These are PUD contracts. But PUDs are like figuring, whoa, how do we get out of this? Because if you wait till 10 years and don't do anything, it's going to be you guys remember, whoops, the nuclear plant fiasco here in Washington that we're you're still paying for? This is whoops, too, unless we get on this really fast. Okay, so the only way to deal with this is removing high-cost, underperforming assets is the only way out of insolvency. So if you've got 17 federal dams, what you want to do is what do they cost? What does each one of them cost? And that's what this EIS does with us, some guys correcting these numbers over the last 10, 4 or 5 years have shown that the asset you need to get rid of is the four snake dams. Um, it may, it'll probably take more than that to make them solvent, but that's a huge first step. Okay, the opportunity. Um, each of these snake river dams and the reservoir, and this is the people that, you know, you hear all this 98% survival over the dams, well, that's a high, that's the high number. The, the, the average is about 95%. The low is, is 90, and at times it's far lower than that. Um, but the reservoirs also kill a lot of smolts, uh, and that's because of hot water, um, this dissolved gas trauma stuff that I'm, I've been talking about, and most importantly, predators, invasive fish like smallmouth bass and walleyes and pike minnows and stuff like that. And so they're killing about 10% of the juvenile pass, uh, salmon passing through. So. There are 20 million Chinook that, are, that go through the lower snake dams each year. Um, a lot, most of those are, in fact, those are the hatchery numbers. There's some additional wilds, but not too many anymore. Um, and so, um, and, and those eggs are in those hatcheries right now, in those streams right now. So they're sitting there, and they're, you know, they're going to, you know, start hatching any day now, and that kind of thing. And, um, and so breaching two dams, which we say we need to do, will stop the killing of about four million of these young Chinook. Chinook. So this is why Snake River Dam breaching not only saves us rate money and tax money, it's the only way, because these salmon are already there, and we need to not kill them. <laughs> That's the, the quickest way to get salmon is to quit killing them. Um, okay, so of those four million, about half of them make it past the other dams and into the ocean, and about 14 months after they go through the lower Snake River, and remember they're already about six months old or nine months old, about 14 months, 18 months later, there'll be several hundred thousand available for southern residents and fishermen. That's, what, that's, the, that's the Chinook opportunity alone, okay? And it's the fastest way to get there. In fact, um, these are some points that are important, and this is what the ORCA task force is looking at. Oh, more hatchery fish, spilling more water, building more habitat, killing more sea lions, and doing some more studies. I've been to all four of these task force meetings, and some of you have been too, and you've seen this. And what they're not looking at <laughs> seriously, or, or barely at all, is dam breaching. But, uh, we, but we know this. Nothing can produce this many shook this fast other than dam breaching. None of this stuff will do it. Now, not that this stuff isn't bad, right? It's, it's, it's good stuff to do, except this more study stuff. We don't need any more studies. Um, and, and I don't know about killing sea lions or birds, but the habitat stuff is work, and, and hatchery production maybe. 
But the key point is, even if it's, that stuff has benefit, it's worthless if you don't breach the Snake River dams. And, you know, the real tragedy is the billions that have been spent on habitat work is being wasted because we're killing so many salmon with dams, they're not even able to use this habitat. So that's more your tax money being, and ratepayer money being wasted. Um, with a natural river, here are some of the costs. Uh, the corrected breaching cost is, is around 340 million for all four dams. You hear one to two billion a lot of times, um, it, and that's just wrong. Uh, Governor Inslee even thinks that you know, it's going to cost a billion dollars in the, in the taxpayer, the state of Washington taxpayers are supposed to pay that. That's wrong. Where is he getting this information? I don't know. But anyway, um, like we said, the benefit cost ratio is at least four dollars to one if the hydropower is replaced, but you don't need to replace it. Um, we've already said that. What's interesting is that um, when you breach, you actually um, allow more uh, solar and so forth. And in fact, right now, today, there's 2,000 megawatts of solar that people, in, you know, utility energy providers doing solar are trying to put 2,000 megawatts of solar on the grid. It's in it, what they call the integration queue. And you can Google BPA integration queue, and you'll see these, this little table that shows you all the power, and it's, most of it is solar and wind, that people have figured out it's cheaper. I mean, they're, they're trying to get it on the grid so they could sell it. Um, okay, so breaching can save a ton of money um, for other habitat restorations area. And maybe you guys have heard about the Puget Sound Near Shore Restoration Project, uh, Corps of Engineer Project to you know, help our, the Salish Sea, particularly the uh, Puget Sound. $400 million needed. That money is not gonna be here as long as you're dumping millions into the Snake River. That's just the way the budget process works. And so we're getting, Puget Sound's getting hammered because there's no money in any kind of meaningful amount to do this nearshore restoration project. Over in eastern Washington, you get three to 4,000 more jobs along the river, the six counties along the river, Lewiston, Idaho. Um, an interesting thing is when the, it, when the land gets transferred to the state of Washington after breaching, you actually, um, any, um, revenue generated from sale or lease of lands, and we estimate about 30 million, would go into the state school budgets. Well, that's, that's a nice little bonus, given, you know, our state school budget situ situation. Um, and of course, it shifts federal money to other needs. All right, so um, really quickly, this is how you do it. It's policy papers, not lit litigation. This, this is policy paper in EIS. Two bulldozers. That's all it takes. We have some other pieces of equipment, but, and this is what you get, is you remove the earth and berm, and you get this free-flowing river around. You leave all that concrete there, turn it into, you know, some kind of amusement park or something. Um, the, um, and this, you know, people think, well, there's people that swear the Corps have never studied dam breaching. I can show you a document put out by Sierra Club that said that really embarrassing. Um, but this image is from the 2002 EIS. They, the, the breach plan is this thick. It's, the, it's there. It's a well-engineered piece of stuff. We, the only thing wrong with it is the cost estimate, which we have fixed. It used to be 300 or $880 million to remove that earth and berm. It's only 340, like I mentioned earlier. So what else? Oh, the five policy means, really quickly. The, uh, the Corps needs no new authorities to place a project into a non-operational status um, by removing the earthen berms. People say, well, you've got to have congressional appropriations or authorization. No, you don't. Um, the Corps already has an environmental impact statement. And, um, and like I said, if you had to update it, it could be done really quickly in three or four months. So you've got a NEPA document. The, this court litigation that you guys have been hearing about for 20 years in the you know, recent rendering two years ago where the, guy, the judge says uh, he'll give the feds five years to come up with a new environmental impact statement um, is, is um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, and the court says this, we can't do anything until the judge gives us a new decision. That's absolutely wrong. That, that waiting on the courts while you're 
wasting tax money and killing salmon and affecting orcas, which are all against the law, basically, doesn't get, you don't get a get out of, get out of jail free card just because you're going to be in court in three more years on a piece of paper. Doesn't work that way. But they'll tell you that it, that's what it, the way it works. This is actually the buyout process, and I just show this because this is, this is the original court case back here that led to these buy-ops and to this EIS and so forth. But what happened in 2000, we, we had a biological opinion, or NOAA did, in the, um, those agencies that review um, the Corps' assessment. And it was immediately litigated by uh, environmental groups. And you know, okay, fine. Um, uh, the problem was, that in 2002, we signed the EIS. Now, if you wanted to sue on something, it probably should have been this, because it has dam breaching in it as a solution. But instead, the litigation process went on, and the, um, the plaintiffs won five times, um, and everybody got focused on this, and they forgot that this EIS was sitting there. Valid, Secretary of the Army confirmed that that is the EIS that's being used on this project, and so here we are, and, and actually this is two years old, I did this chart, we could, we could have done this in 2016. This, this track over here is leading to more paper in maybe 2021 or 22. Everything's, you know, we're, we're going to be finished with Chinook by then, and Orcas probably. There, that is the, um, you know, the EIS and the record of decision. And what it says on page 25 is, is this business that I think I said, maybe, or somebody else, I, I said it earlier, is that it says that if you didn't do anything to the dams back then, that would be slightly better than spending money on improvements to the dams. And so we did, we gambled a billion dollars and lost. Um, of course, dam breaching was always the best alternative. Um, well, the other thing is, well, who, who pays for breaching? You got to get federal appro uh, congressional appropriations? No. Under the current funding uh, arrangement set up in law, the Bonneville Power Administration has to pay for the breaching. And they can also, because of a fish, cre a fish mitigation mechanism they have in a, a 1980 act, they can actually get a credit for all or part of that breach cost. And the, 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 the credit comes against debt they owe on the dams, which is $17 billion. So, uh, and that debt will never be paid back. And if it did, Bonneville would have to, I heard this from a public utility commissioner last week. He said, we can't pay the debt back because if we did, it, our, our, our rates would go double digit increases every year. So we're just piling up debt, paying a lot of interest and, and still going broke. And then the fifth thing is that, that breaching really is easy. Um, it, the decision is simple. You don't need any more paper, you know, record of decision, a five-page document, a commander signs it, and you're good to go. Um, and it doesn't cost this billion or two. Um, we've got, you know, it's three to four, in, in, including some contingencies for irrigation and some transportation stuff from farmers. So you're probably going, so what have we done with all this government information that we piled up? Well, um, there's, uh, there's, there's my business cards. Those are ones just from congressional meetings, and here they are. This is real. You know, that's, that's like 50 or 60 meetings with staffers. Um, I've yet to meet a senator except at a fundraiser, and I did my three-minute elevator speech and embarrassed the hell out of them. That's a tough way to talk to a politician, by the way. You know, that's not what they want to hear at a fundraiser. You know, breach the dams. Um, but I did it anyway. Um, and you can see all the other meetings that we've been after. Um, it's, it's just tens of thousands of emails and so forth. Um, I want to I wanna take a break, uh, not a break, but I want to bring somebody up uh, to, to take, talk to you more about the social media and the public involvement, because this has really been making a difference. And what I'd like to um, bring up first is Dr. Jeff Fintry. Jeff, are you around here someplace? Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce Jeff. Do I have a computer? No, it's just Jeff Kelly's got it, yeah. Oh, and uh, Jeff was a, a SeaWorld trainer, and um, you know, he basically is one of these guys that stepped out of the box and said, this isn't right. 
and I'll, you, he can tell the rest of the story, but I'll let him talk about the next couple of slides if, uh, if they're still there. Anyway, uh, this is more of our public moment. Go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Jim and, and Howard and Ken. Um, I literally was performing with uh, Captive Killer Whales in September of uh, 1995 when a lady by the name of Astrid Van Ginneken invited me to join Ken and Howard for two weeks in June of 1996 in, at the Center for Whale Research. And uh, I was, by 1997, I had moved to Portland where I continued uh, professional school with uh, Dr. Eric Loberger who's here tonight. So thank you, Eric, for coming out. I also want to thank um, uh, Danny LeClaire of the uh, Shoshone Bannock tribe coming all the way from Idaho who shared dinner with us tonight. And uh, it was enjoyable talking with him and all the First Nations people and just everyone that's here tonight. Um, I don't, I'm not an expert in, uh, well, I kind of know a little bit about killer whales, and, and, uh, but not nearly as much as Ken or, or Howard or Jim on this. But I do want to share something that happened uh, regarding uh, blackfish. And because I think that's why I was asked to talk, actually. Kelly asked me to talk, and I initially said no. And then Jim called me two nights ago and said, I want you to say something. So here we are. Um, can you go to the next slide? Um, uh, you know, this, uh, I'm on Twitter, and uh, there's some people out there doing a lot of good work, like Hayes Summer. I know the center is now tweeting, and there's a lot of people trying to raise awareness, trying to bring this issue to a uh, critical mass, to a critical threshold where it clicks in the, in the community. We're looking for the blackfish moment, so to speak, for, for the salmon issue, because, um, Kelly, can you advance that slide because I'm actually uh, using it to pr uh, prime myself. I was going to ask you guys a few questions. I know most of the people in here. Who's from Washington in here? Any Oregonians in here? What about Idaho? First Nations in here? Yeah. Um, who in here understands the salmon life cycle? I mean, I think we all do, right? Good. Um, orca gestation, we all know now, thanks to SeaWorld, uh, is 18 months. That's a long time to make new babies, and that's one of the thing that, things that, you know, Ken and the southern residents are, are dealing with. It's just the, without adequate nutrition and calories, it's impossible for them to have babies. And then when they go into starvation mode, their metabolism kicks off all these PCBs into their metabolism, and that abortion rate's through the roof. Um, who here has seen Blackfish movie? Great. Kelly, can you advance that? Um, I have three quick stories. Uh, two weeks ago, this is in real time, I was in the gym in Ellensburg where I live. So everyone in here knows that the Snake River is the most productive branch of the Columbia River, but who, anyone here want to guess what number two is? It's the Yakima River. I live on the Yakima River. It's the second most productive uh, fishery, so to speak, in the, in the Columbia system, and it too has some dams on it. And the title of my presentation was What Happens in the Snake Doesn't Stay in the Snake. Um, I work as a medical doctor at Virginia Mason Memorial, and I work with a, a gal that's a prosthetist, and she makes legs for amputees, and she's also a professional fishing guide. So I'm, also, I'm always getting feedback on how trout and salmon are doing in the Yakima, Yakima River. And as everyone in here knows, these salmon populations, um, they're crashing. And so it's the same, th okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, it's really a sad state of affairs, but two weeks ago I was in the gym and there was a fishing guide in there because there's lots of them in Ellensburg. And um, I, heard, I heard him talking to the guy sitting, we were in the, sh you know, the locker room, they were sitting down. And uh, the fishing guide said that the, uh, he was from Lewiston, Idaho, and that the North 40 store, which is an outfitter store, a gear store, in Lewiston, Idaho, recently stopped selling salmon and steelhead fishing gear simply because there's no fish left. Now, think about that. This, this used to be a mecca uh, for salmon and steelhead, and now they're not even selling the means to collect these fish in Lewiston. Another thing that I noticed recently, uh, I bought a grain silo uh, one week ago, and I had to drive to Lewiston to go pick it up. So I got to drive, I picked up this 26-foot uh, budget rental truck in Yakima, and I went through Tri-Cities and all the way up the river to Lewiston, and I noticed um, there's levees in, in Lewiston, and that got my attention because I did my medical uh, residency training in, in New Orleans, which 
has obvious levees because it's a few feet below sea level. And I'm thinking to myself, why in the hell are there levees in a city that's 745 feet above sea level? And that's because we've got these four deadbeat dams on the Snake River that are trying to push barges uphill. And that's why these are run of the river dams, because you have to keep the, the water level at the very top of these dams to get the barges the ability to, 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 to get to Lewiston. And, and the fact that Lewiston has these levees is just beyond belief to me. Um, two days ago at work, I had a nurse come up to me and she said, Dr. Ventry, I just watch Blackfish. Many of you know, you know, Howard is a big part of Blackfish and Ken's in the movie as well. So the three of us were all a part of this when Gabriella came to San Juan Island to interview us and to take pictures of wild killer whales. She came up to me and she said, I had no idea of the issues associated with captivity. And she felt guilty that she had taken her daughter to SeaWorld in California. And um, I said, yeah, one of the best things about Blackfish is that it pulled the curtain back on what really happens in captivity. And it got me thinking um, about this situation, because when you really um, look at what we're talking about here today, you've heard Ken, the orcas need food. You've heard Jim, these dams are losers. Pardon my French, this is a fucking no-brainer. You know, you know what I mean? This is a fucking no-brainer. And, you know, I'm, I'm an independent voter, but you can see that on, to the left, the leadership in Washington are, are being sissies about this. This is something that they could champion and win. And then, you know, the GOP on their side, they pride themselves in being the masters of economics. This is an economic win for them. So the problem here is something that I also learned at Superpod 6 from Dr. Katie Comer, who was studying the blackfish effect and how this has crossed over into the salmon effect, and the reason why I'm talking right now, is that this is all about rhetoric and getting the right story out. And that's what we're here doing tonight. So thank you all for being here. Kelly, can you advance that? Because um, here's, our, here's our story. Uh, I'm just repeating uh, some slides that I copied from the damn stupid website. This issue, if we take down these dams, they save money, they save orcas, and they save salmon. What more could you want? This is what the media needs to know. Kelly, can you advance that slide? Oh, so last week, or whatever the date is on this tweet, um, everyone read this. Uh, it was a, the Tri-City Herald. This is the headline of the, in Pasco. This is the headline of their newspaper. 100,000 jobs depend on these four dams. This is a bogus bullshit talking point that is just repeated that has no basis in reality. So I called uh, the paper and I asked to speak to the editor and she was uncomfortable so she passed me on to the reporter that wrote it and I said, where, where are these numbers coming from? And she didn't have an answer. She just said, well, it was just a quote from, from the, polit the GOP politician that um, gave it to me. And so what we're, what we're seeing is here is there's absolutely no fact checking going on. Howard used the term uh, truth squad. He, he's used that before when, when, when we were talking about, you know, back the ex-trainers for Blackfish were kind of like the truth squad to SeaWorld's bullshit. And then when Gabriella put her movie together, it was airtight. We didn't get sued because we were telling the truth. So we have the truth on our side. And I think we all need to start calling out the, the, the reporters and the journalists that are spreading this bullshit. Um, Kelly, let's see what else we got here. My sister is great on Twitter. She's like, I mean, there's people chiming in. We're just trying to correct the record and set, set the story. Um, let's go forward again. So um, here's you know, Howard and, and Ken and, and Jim and I. This is when Polaris died back in October. Of, uh, of 2016, we're at Pier 66, I think it was, in Seattle. And um, we were trying to, uh, to bring this forward. And, and one thing that Jim asked me to, to point out to people is that we've done our due diligence. We're bringing this story forward, and it's time for the system to work. And, and this meeting is important because we're all cross-pollinating tonight. We're talking with tribal members. We're talking with, there's media here. There's 
film crews here, we're all, you know, sharing facts. And that's what needs to be inserted into this rhetoric for this thing to have its flash blackfish moment. So thank you once again for coming here. Um, let's see what else I got here, Kelly. Um, this is a, a, a lady that wrote a book and, and it, she, this was on like NPR, I think a few months ago. And are you able to play this MP3 file? It's really powerful. And you know, everyone knows that killer whales are the largest member of Delphinidae, right? Or the dolphin family. So she's talking about bottlenose dolphins. But please listen to this. The dolphin brain has arrived at the same destination as the human brain, but in a completely convergent way. Um, it's wired utterly differently than ours. The neocortex, which is very large, is, is very different. So they're clearly processing information in this very different way than we are. My favorite story is this, and it's from a scientist who wrote about it in a book called Beautiful Minds. She was studying a pot of bottlenose dolphins off the coast of Los Angeles in foggy, gloomy conditions, and she was in a research boat with some other scientists, some research assistants, and they were following a pod of bottlenose dolphins that was hunting. It's a typical morning. The dolphins weren't paying a whole lot of attention to the scientists, doing their formation where they're looking for fish, uh, and they found a bunch of fish. And so usually there's nothing that gets a dolphin's attention more than a big batch of fish. These dolphins started to go into their hunting mode where they're herding the fish, and then all of a sudden, one dolphin cut away and went out to sea, and went out to sea about three miles at top speed. And after a few moments, the other dolphins followed, broke away from feeding and followed. And it was such bizarre behavior that the scientists went as well. And the dolphins got there, and they formed a circle. And in the middle of the circle, there was a girl's body floating, a young girl. And she had a plastic bag wrapped around her neck with her ID in it and a suicide note. And she wasn't dead. She was very close to death, but she was saved by the scientists and the dolphins. Susan Casey, she's the author of Voices in the Ocean, a journey into the wild and haunting world of dolphins. I just wanted to end with that because it's, you know, so moving. This is what we're giving up. So thank you for letting me talk tonight. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I got a couple more slides and I'm going to wrap this up and then get into some questions. And also, you guys need to eat some more food and drink some wine over here. Um, so, you find my. And I just want to cover a little bit about public participation. We, um, uh, you know, I mentioned Damn Sense is basically a, um, a website that we started a few years ago. It, it's not an organization. But in the last couple of years, it's actually turned into a movement. I mean, people think we're some sort of big environmental NGO. We're not. We're, we're a handful of people, and we're really doing everything you, we can to possibly get the, you know, the word out here with the truth that Jeff's talking about. Um, but also, the work of things have really ignited, lit a fire under the, a lot of the information that we've been putting out there. And um, you may have seen that there's a petition running around. We're going we're to show it real quick. Uh, sort of. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking, but basically um, a petition was started by the Southern Resident Killer Whale um, Chinook Initiative about four years ago and um, kind of creeped along, got about 40,000 signatures on it. But in the last uh, four or five months, that has gone to 340,000 signatures. Um, this this is starting, this is getting the attention of the politicians. However, petitions alone won't do it. Um, you've got to get in their face, and, and, and that's kind of the challenge right now. You know, a handful of us can't affect all these politicians. So we need people to, um, you know, got to step up, um, call their elected official, ask for a meeting, whatever it takes. Um, Anyway, so uh, let me continue with this. Uh, our Damn Sense Facebook page has you know, got some pretty good reach these days. A lot of followers uh, reach out there and so forth. Um, but we need more than this. We, we really in desperate situation here. We, the, the, for the Corps to start breaching these dams in December, the Corps has got to make a decision now, in the next week or couple weeks actually. Um, now we know that if 
that, you know, if we can't get two dams started, we can get one dam, we, that gives us another month, but that only saves half the salmon we're talking about. So um, it's really important to, um, you know, do something now. We're trying everything we can. Um, you may have noticed this little brochure here. I don't know if you've actually had a chance to look at it. But, you know, we talked about jobs and opportunities in eastern Washington. Well, this is, this is our, you know, this is a, a food magazine for the Lower Snake Valley. <laughs> and we're going to drop these all over eastern Washington and kind of get the idea that this is, this is what we're talking about. This is, this is what three or 4,000 jobs looks like when you see the results in a magazine and, you know, you're talking about farms and viticulture and so forth like that. But it's going to take more than this, and, and so we really need people to step up. Um, and so that's the point of this slide is that uh, we, we, we just, our little team cannot do this fast enough. The petitions alone won't do it. It's impressing them. But it, it's not the same thing as them getting hammered by somebody that's a friend of theirs or, um, you know, people just going in meeting after meeting to ask for the Governor Inslee or whoever. Um, but if we don't do this pretty quick, it may be too late. And one last comment from me. Um, some of you have probably noticed this. If you've been to an ORCA task force meeting or some of these other public meetings like it were two years ago with the Columbia River System Operation Review that got started, we're finding that people like you, the informed public, know more about these dams, more about the ORCAs, more about the salmon, more about the economics than the government people that are supposed to be making these decisions for us. And this is a tragedy. But the, and the other thing is, is that it's going to be people like us sitting here, whether we're just one person talking to our congressman, or we've got a company that can go talk because we've got clout, or whatever it is, but it's going to be us, because we cannot rely on any government agency right now, or any politician, or even a lot of uh, organizations. I mean, we're talking individuals here, people like you, and really appreciate you being here. And so thanks for being here, and we'll continue with questions. And, and by the way, the questions are not just for me, but for Ken or uh, Tony or anybody. You know, we'll go, go ahead. Uh, Hi, sorry. Uh, my name is Jeff Brown. My association with Green Mountain is kind of back in that mood. Uh, um, my question is if the decision is made to capture and rehabilitate and it works, and I'm not saying I'm in favor, where do you draw the line saying, Um, the, you said, where do we draw the line with? Where do you draw the line if you see any other orcas that are in the same condition? Where do you draw the line to capture them and rehabilitate or not? I that's yours. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm drawing the line on the fact that this little whale is still with her family and is being fed by her family. If she were on a beach stranded someplace, yes, let's, let's uh, intervene, especially if her family is gone, and do what we can. But what I'm trying to do is prevent this from happening by having healthy food and a healthy population of whales. That, that's the main thing. I mean, there have been dozens of these little babies that have orphaned and died or whatever in the past and nothing was done. At least this one's getting a lot of attention. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, yeah, so Joel. Joel. Well, uh, about capturing little J50, if, you know, what is the degree of separation? 
it was really astonishing that she was missing for two days with a great search for her and then on the third day showed up with her mom so she was she was reported way behind the pod when they came in the Strait of Juan de Fuca um, as I say my personal feeling is that she's got to be stranded or in a bay by herself and the others are clearly not in the area but I think that the the sentiment is to jump at the chance that they can catch her, you know, maybe even a mile from her family. I, I don't know what, but I do think that, uh, you know, they're, they're not, they don't have bad intentions. And if, if there is a reaction by the pod, I think they'll probably back off. It, it, that could be interesting to see, but uh, I think it's premature to catch her in with her family or even in the same vicinity. I have another question to add on that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I also heard of uh, possible plans if they did catch her to take her down to Manchester, but obviously would be very far uh, away from where she thought she knows now. I'm just wondering, 2018, do you know anything uh, about that? Or would you try to keep her uh, off the left side? Well, yeah, I had heard just rumor. I had heard nothing official because I objected at the beginning and had been left out of the discussion. But uh, I've heard that they may take her to Manchester if she's captured in the United States. That's the National Marine Fisheries Facility. And to the Vancouver Aquarium if she's captured in Canada. That, those are the options. Both NIMFS and DFO are going forth of the program. Now, both of those things are not supposed to be permanent, but then who's going to call unreleasable at some point? It's, it's bizarre. Who's deciding? Who's the they? When you say they are doing this or that, who's the decision maker? The decision, well, the conference call I was on was with National Marine Fisheries people, Veterinarians from the, uh, well, Joe Gatos, the Sea Doc Society, the Vancouver Aquarium, the DFO, Department of Fisheries and Oceans people. Um, and then the first hour of it was like, the recommendation was, no, don't, don't do this. And then apparently after the conference call or at the very end of it, uh, they decided to go ahead and do it. Pardon? They have somebody with them that's done it before. Oh, yeah. All these people are experienced in dealing with marine mammals. It's not, it's not like uh, somebody's going to go out and try a rodeo. They've, they've done other rodeos. Shanna. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. She, she was an Earth Watcher. She and her dad back in the 80s, I guess. No, like, I've loved you since I was like 12. Like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> he's, he's as good as they get. Yeah, no. Uh, well, let's see. Yes, sir. You quick. Really, going to have a chance. 
Right. I think these whales were telling us recently that you better, we better get this act together pretty quick. Uh, but you know, between nonchalance and panic, <laughs> I don't, don't want to just panic because the, you know, for me, I mean, we all love whales, but the economic situation, doesn't everybody have some concern about that? Why is it being protected? Where's this, follow the money somewhere. This money part should appeal to everybody. The whale part, you know, we can be vociferous and go ahead. Yeah, when you ask what we do, it, the process is real simple when you're dealing, in this case, with a Corps of Engineers who can make a decision here, but they are not going to make a decision unless some politician pushes them. That's just the way the process works. But it's simple. It, it, we really have to get to Governor Inslee, whether it's an individual or a handful of people or whoever can get in on his calendar and talk to him and lay this stuff out. Ken and I have been trying to meet with him for three years and we keep getting blown off. We just don't have the clout to get in there. Um, same with Senator Murray, same with Senator Cantwell, same with our congressman. Finally met with my congressman after three years. But it took a briefing like this in Gig Harbor and a bunch of guys stood up and women said, we've, we've got it, we've heard, we've heard enough and we're not gonna let this Congressman Kilmer blow you off anymore. And so they got a meeting. So that's what it's gotta take is, is, is political pressure on the core. Now we've been working the core and we've been working these guys with the information. They can't hide from the truth much long. I mean, they really can't. So it, that's what it takes though. Um, let me, uh, yeah, go ahead, Michelle. That's what it takes. Um, we need about 20 more or 30 more Michelles. Uh, one group I didn't mention that we can hit hard is your public utility commissioners. Because these are the guys that are sitting on their hands and letting BPA run wild with our rates. And so go to a commissioner meeting and throw down, read that paper we got over there about BPA's financial crisis and throw it in front of them and say, why aren't you doing something? Uh, Aaron, you had a question back there? Yeah, I can't hear you. You need to come up. Maybe you can come up. I can't hear you this far. <laughs> you know, tinnitus, you know, too much time in the arm, you're blowing stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the question? Hi, uh, this question is for Anthony Jones. It's kind of a wonky question. Um, and I, I worked for the Endangered Species Coalition, so I'm, you know, I've, I've known a lot of these details, but I'm curious. Anthony Jones, why you uh, chose to select 90, the last 96,000 hours um, uh, for the Lower Snake River dams? What was the reasoning behind that number? And what are your thoughts on the Northwest Energy Coalition study? <laughs> question, the question I understand it, why did I select the last 96,000 hours to illustrate the lack of need for the Lower Snake dams? 
And the reason I selected 96,000 was because I performed that analysis early in the spring. That number is now over 101,000 hours. The, the point is, is try to picture this. Two equal sized amounts of power. The Bonneville Power Administration generates one section of power for its core customers and an equal amount for export. They export 53% of the power they produce on an annual basis. They think of this, they only use half their power for their core customers. Now that was cool prior to 2008 because prior to 2008 the wholesale market was paying 50, 60, 70 dollars a megawatt for the power. That allowed Bonneville to pay down the rates that they charged Northwest customers, pay them down to the 20s. But something changed in 2009. In 2009, all the investments in California for solar power started to gain traction, and the surplus market, instead of being in the 70s, dropped to the 20s, okay? Bonneville Power is still making all that extra power, but instead of getting profits from that extra power, they are now raising the rates on the core customers to pay to send the power to California, okay? So now they're raising the rates. Currently the priority rate for Bonneville Power customers is about 36. There's a rate case in progress and they're gonna be raising the rates to 38, probably 40. The chart that Jim showed earlier showed the rates go into 40. The reason they're gonna charge core customers 40 is so they can charge, is so they can sell that 53% of their total power off system for 20 or 25, okay? The Northwest, via BPA and the Corps of Engineers, is subsidizing California at this point. And getting back to the 96,000 hours question, it's been over 101,000 hours since you can even demonstrably show that any power from the Lower Snake Dams even went to a Northwest customer. Not needed, simply used. Because at that moment, at two o'clock in the morning in February of 2009, all of the thermal plants were shut down. BPA had extra resources they could have brought online. So the point being, the lower snake dams are totally surplus, they're totally needed, and in their absence, nobody will shiver in the dark, nobody will sweat in the heat. Aaron also asked about a study by the Northwest Energy Coalition on replacement power. They spent a lot of money in saying that the replacement uh, the snow or lower snake dams could be replaced, but it would cost two to three hundred million dollars a year. That's really crazy. They use Bonneville Power's pricing for wind from ten years ago to come up with those numbers, and we, Tony and a bunch, and jumped on them and said, "Why are you using ten-year-old BPA data to justify this?" And it was just crazy. Uh, that report is worthless um, because if, if there's nothing else, you just learn from the night. It's surplus power. We don't need to replace that power. It's already out there in abundance. Next question. Ah, yes. Yes, sir. 
let me get that. If, if you, the question is, is the question is, is this is a good time for this transition? And there are three things in play here at this moment. One, Bonneville Power is arguably going bankrupt because the cost of their power is well in excess of what people are willing to pay for it. Bonneville Power is losing about $100 million a year, a $1 million every three days, okay? Now, like them or hate them, Bonneville Power is going to be around, so we probably would like them to at least be financially stable. They're, they're going to be around for their transmission system and a bunch of other things. We would like Bonneville Power to be stable, but we would like them to also be responsible. Okay. The other thing is, is the orca are starving. They need fish. They need something to eat. So that needs to be done too. Um, and where to get the fish fastest? Arguably, breaching the lower snake dams is the fastest way to do that. So how to kill three stones, three birds with one stone, is breach the lower snake dams. It would make Bonneville power more stable. It would make the orcas more likely to survive because it would make the fish more abundant. That's why, that's why this would be an excellent time to breach the lower snake dams. There is a no better time. There hasn't been a better time in 20 years, and there is not going to be a better time in the future. One other thing I may have noted in your question is the green energy power thing, and um, what very few people know is that the, these reservoirs emit methane. If you know anything about methane, and I was a climate guy, remember, um, it's 85 more times more potent than carbon, and so even though it's a small amount of methane, it's uh, 47,000 ton carbon equivalent methane emissions off the lower, four lower snake dams. So they are not, they're carbon free, but they are not global warming gas free, okay? Uh, maybe a couple more and then we'll kind of huddle around and yeah, go ahead. Throwing um, uh, hatch 
hatchery fish in front of them or something else. The, the big answer that, that Inslee and everybody says, and just tons of people, is we've got to shoot all the sea lions and, and crank out the hatchery fish. And that's how we're going to save the orcas. But are the orcas, do they eat that much hatchery fish? Are they even interested? Is it a solution that will work? They, they, de they definitely eat hatchery fish. But you can't raise hatchery fish fast enough to feed them. Really? Really? That, you want to add anything to that, Howard? I'm sure he can. <laughs> He's probably getting yeah, some I don't see Ken. I think he needed something. He'd, he'd have a much more eloquent answer probably, but yeah. um, they will eat hatchery fish. Uh, I'm sure they prefer the big springers and they can discriminate, but it's not by smell. I don't claim to understand it, but they don't have any sense of smell. Mm -hmm. Weird, but they don't. But their echolocation is so good that they can get every subtle little clue to know exactly what kind of fish. They can discriminate, you know, Chinook from every other species, but they also eat other species. They do eat chum and coho, and they'll even go for, you know, the occasional halibut and flounder, the steelhead. So, you know, they will eat a side dish, but, you know, they depend on those big fat Chinook. Um, so, yeah, I mean, hatchery fish, they need them right now because that's all there is, just about. So, it, it's just a matter of, but they're not sustainable. You know, they're industrial mass production, so, uh, and, and they don't survive. They don't have the survival capability like the wild fish do. Wild fish will sustain themselves. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're free if they've got habitat. Uh, so they're, they're what the orcas really depend on and will depend on, and the only thing that is stable for them would be abundant wild runs from many rivers, but the snake is by far the biggest. Thank you. Uh, Hannah? Oh, the noise? Yeah. yeah, and what solutions are needed in terms of addressing that threat, and um, whether the whale watching industry has anything to do with it, and whether we should not go on whale watching. Well, that is clearly a very complicated and controversial issue that's been around for a long time. Um, if Ken were here, he'd have a one-word answer, no. Uh, but, you know, it is complex, and yeah, there is some effect. Um, a couple of things to sort of, you know, uh, qualify that is that uh, they're, uh, they're trying to mitigate that. They're, they're, they're trying to, to cooperate and police themselves and operate according to good guidelines, and there are good studies if they keep a good distance, if they go slow, if they don't accelerate anywhere near them, uh, or get in their path, or if they don't do something that is going to obviously disturb them, you know, it can be done gently and respectfully and not impact them. The noise, for the most part, comes from recreational boaters, from the big ships that travel by, even though they're at a, a low frequency for the most part. It's actually a pretty broad spectrum, but uh, you know there are many other sources of noise, and there's a positive aspect to the whale watching that I've seen and, and heard many stories about so many people who go out and if there's a good naturalist, and that's a pretty important key, they hear about the orcas in a way that they not only care about them deeply because of their, you know, their family ties, their, their, you know, so much about them that is so near and dear to us, but also their troubles that, you know, they need a constituency, they need people to understand. And hopefully more and more of those naturalists are talking about, we got to bring down those dams. I think, you know, most are. Uh, so. They, they can really convey a message to a whole lot of people that can 
have a big effect. So there's a real positive side of that. So it's complicated. They've got to behave right. They've got to respect. Um, and to the most part, they are doing that. So, you know, that's, that would be my subtly nuanced answer. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll tell you what. Why don't we do this? Again, more questions. Hit us, you know, as we break apart and go get some more food. And I'll let uh, Jesse, you got one last thing to say, and then we'll, we'll kind of break out and mingle. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, we need to thank Kelly, wherever she is. We're putting all this together. <laughs> Give her a hand. You know, I want to thank Kelly, too, for all the organization, and thank Jim and everybody else here, you know, and everybody else that's been a part of this and everything. And, you know, just like everybody else, I've been to all those ORCA task force meetings. I have. You know, especially when the first one, when we met, when I met Jim, I sat there and I said at the first ORCA task force meeting, I asked and I told Jay Inslee, that he needs to buy by what was already agreed upon to my elders, and he needs to breach the dams. I've already said that at the first Orchid Task Force meeting. So I've already had this announced, but I mean, the only thing I wanted to say though, to finish this up too, is you remember when I told you that they removed my ancestors? They sit in this museum. They're here. The majority of my ancestors that they removed are in this museum. And there's others that are in, in a, a museum over in Europe who I'm named after, who I'm named after this war bonnet. They cut him in half. They put him up in the museum and they took the other half around to show. And he was, and he was buried in a canoe. He was buried in a canoe. So I mean, I just wanted to share that with you that my ancestors are still real because they're, still, they're being observed. They need to be reburied. They need to be brought home. So I wanted to thank you guys, thank everybody though. Thank you. <laughs>